Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back for another of our five minute histories videos. And today we're gonna to head back over to the Upton neighborhood. Um, we talked about Upton a few videos ago featuring Harvey Johnson, uh, the civil rights pioneer. And today we're gonna to go over to Utah Place and talk about Lily Carroll Jackson in the Lily Carroll Jackson Museum. Um, uh, 1320 Utah, I believe it is. Um, Lily Carroll Jackson was born in the late 1800s. Um, she was born here in Baltimore. She attended a church, Sharp Street Methodist Church, uh, where she sang. And in fact, uh, it was there where she met her uh, future husband, Kiefer Jackson. Jackson was from Mississippi, and he was a Methodist evangelist, um, and he, he had kind of an unusual way of uh, going about his business. Um, he showed religious movies. He traveled around the country uh, with a horse and cart and went to various churches and gathering places and showed uh, uh, religious movies. When they were married in 1910, I believe, um, she joined him. And so she traveled around uh, uh, various places, mostly in the South, I think, um, showing movies. Um, sometimes I believe she sang, so that the movies were silent movies, and I believe she sang. Uh, but it was in those travels that helped reinforce uh, within her and helped her see uh, the discrimination that was facing African Americans, um, not just in Baltimore and, in, and not just in Maryland, uh, but all over the country and certainly all over the South. Um, they returned to Baltimore in the 19 teens, um, and it was here that uh, Lily Carroll Jackson got her start as a civil rights uh, leader. Um, and we're going to talk about an era in the 1930s and 40s. I think most of us. Uh, think about the civil rights in the, say, 1950s or 60s. Um, uh, but Baltimore and Lily Carroll Jackson were part of an effort uh, that really built the foundation for the later civil rights mo uh, movement. So she did a, a number of things that were important. I want to talk about two. Um, the first is she looked out and saw uh, civil rights leaders, emerging civil rights leaders um, here and elsewhere. But what she saw was missing was youth. And in 1930, so this is 1930, she and her daughter Juanita Jackson Mitchell, um, who will get her own five minute video, so uh, stay tuned for that, um, formed something called the uh, Young People, Citywide Young People's Forum. Um, and it was really the first time in the country uh, that a formidable group of young people formed uh, to try to uh, advance civil rights. Um, uh, one of the things that they did was they launched a Buy Where You Can Work campaign along Pennsylvania Avenue and elsewhere, uh, picketing uh, uh, establishments that would sell their products to African Americans uh, but would not hire African Americans. The idea of a citywide uh, young people's group um, took off. Other cities like Chicago and New York and Philadelphia um, took the Baltimore model and, uh, and adopted it in their own cities. Um, and the second, uh, and also adopted this uh, sort of up and coming uh, idea that Lily, Ch Lily Carroll Jackson had of uh, civil disobedience. Um, in the 1930s, uh, she was protesting and picketing and really uh, she, she may not have been the very first person to do it, uh, but she was among the first and she certainly was at the very leading edge of showing how collective action, um, nonviolent collective action could have significant impacts in advancing civil rights, uh, in opening up um, restaurants and movie theaters uh, for African Americans. Um, Jackson was head of the Baltimore branch of the NAACP from 1935 until 1970. Um, in that time, she grew our branch to, uh, to become the biggest branch in the country. Um, and also uh, uh, was elected to the board of directors of the national NAACP and used that platform uh, to take some of the ideas uh, that she was uh, pioneering here in Baltimore and, uh, and expand them nationally. So she was a, um, she was a leader here locally in Baltimore, uh, but really her impact uh, uh, is felt throughout the country. If you think of things like the, um, uh, the sort of classic now, pictures of lunch counter sit-ins um, here and elsewhere. We'll get to those as well in another video. Uh, but uh, if you think of those, those were really an outgrowth of the ideas that Lily Carroll Jackson was, uh, was testing here in Baltimore. Uh, when she died, she left uh, her house to become a museum, um, and it is a museum. Uh, Morgan State University operates it, and it's fantastic. We'll, we'll put the website for it up at the end, um, and I, I would encourage you to check it out. In fact, uh, just yesterday, I got off the phone, I had a phone call with the director of the museum, as uh, we're, we as Baltimore Heritage are part of a partnership 
uh, with the Maryland Historical Society and the Lily Carroll Jackson Museum and Baltimore City Public Schools developing curricula and, uh, and field trips to get some of this civil rights information into the school system. I'm gonna close with one quote from uh, uh, then Governor Mayor McKeldin. Um, this is what he said about Lily Carroll Jackson uh, in the 1950s. He said, I would rather have the devil after me than Mrs. Jackson give her what she wants. And he said that uh, in particular about uh, a bill that she was pushing in the state legislature um, that became the 1958 Maryland Fair Housing Practices Act uh, that, uh, that made it a illegal to discriminate based on race in hiring. That Maryland law was a predecessor for the national law um, against discrimination in hiring that came about a decade later. All right, I think that's it for now. I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon and we'll see you tomorrow.